Chapter 5, The Shortcut On that fateful morning, I woke up and felt the sun in my eyes. Now, Kabul is always sunny in the summer, and we did go to school in the summer there. Our vacation came in the winter. But I always got up before the sun had climbed above the mountain that loomed to the east of our compound. That light shining in my eyes told me I was late. I sat up and listened and did not hear a sound. For some reason, everybody in my house had overslept. It was eight o'clock, class had already started, and I was missing precious minutes of my teacher's stories. I jumped out of bed. In Kabul, a schoolgirl wears a black dress with white stockings and a white headscarf. I threw on the uniform as quickly as I could. I didn't have time to pull on the stockings. They were too much trouble. Instead, I put on a pair of traditional white ankle-length pantaloons. I don't remember if I washed my face or not. Probably. I splashed some water on it and said to myself, that's good enough. As for my long hair, I didn't have time to comb it. I just left it tangled and unruly from sleep, grabbed my school box, and rushed out the door, foregoing my usual morning bread and tea. I had no time. Outside, I saw no other school children making their way down the road. They were all in school already. And so I thought, I'll take a shortcut today. By veering off the paved street and cutting across an overgrown brush-filled field directly to the main road that led to my school, I could save two or three minutes. I think most people knew to stay out of this particular field. Perhaps the grown-ups had told me to stay out of it too. I don't know. A child forgets such warnings. I didn't see any warnings posted, but then I wasn't looking. I was late to school, and that's all I could think about. I started across the field. And then suddenly, a fire flashed in my face, and the earth seemed to move between, beneath my feet. I remember a shower of soil, and then nothing. I woke up on the ground, surrounded by a crowd, men and mostly boys, but a few girls too, no women. They were all staring down at me with huge eyes. The color had fled from their faces. They looked horrified. Their lips were moving, but I could hear no voices. All I heard was a loud ringing in my ears. The sun blazed down on me, but shadows kept cutting across the light as people pushed their way into the ring of spectators. They just let me lie there for half an hour or more, I later learned. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know who I was. At that moment, I didn't know who I was either. I could feel a strange anxiety gnawing away inside of me. I was late for school, late for school. I had to get up but the sight of all the horrified faces buried that anxiety and chaotic panic. I tried to look down at my legs, but I couldn't. It was so confusing. I didn't know what had happened or why I couldn't get up. I felt no pain, no physical sensation at all, just mental turmoil and fear. Those horrified people standing over me were arguing. Was it too late? Was I dead? Should they lift me up? How should they do it? Yes, that's what they were disputing. The babble of their voices was beginning to come through the ringing now as they loomed over me. Shadowy faces and figures, sunlight twinkling through the shifting spaces between them. And then at last I found my voice. What happened? I screamed. Why are you standing there? Pick me up. But no one moved to help. They just crowded against one another, jostling for position and craning over one another's shoulders for a better view of me. Such rage came over me then. I screamed at them. Oh, how I screamed. Even now, as I think about it, I detect a coal of the very same anger still smoldering inside me. All the years have not dissolved it away. That unreasoning and unreasonable anger. The crowd was huge and getting bigger. I wasn't wearing stockings. I remembered that suddenly. Stockings took too long to pull on, so I just slipped on a pair of baggy pantaloons that morning under my black school dress. And suddenly, I knew that those pantaloons were gone. Nothing was left except the elastic around my waist. That single fact flooded through me, overwhelming all my senses for an instant. My trousers gone and people gawking at me. Thank goodness I was just a child. But even so, the shame of it, the shame. At that moment, a man leaned over me. I knew him. He was our neighbor. He happened to be passing by when he saw the ring of people in the field and said to himself, I wonder what's going on. He came over for a look and recognized me. That good fellow had a patu, 
a large shawl that Afghans wear over their shoulders for warmth. With great tenderness, he spread the patu over my shivering body. It was he who sent someone to notify my family. My father wasn't home, but my mother came running, howling with dismay. Her lamentation drove my panic to another level. The fear she felt shot right to the core of me as well. Meanwhile, our neighbor had hailed a taxi. He and the taxi driver rolled me onto the patu and lifted the blanket by the corners. That's how they moved me from the ground into the taxi. I don't know what would have happened if that neighbor had not come along and taken charge. I don't know how long the crowd would have just left me there. That neighbor was one in a long series of people who have saved my life. He and my mother got into the cab with me and the driver took off. I still couldn't look down at my legs. It's not that I couldn't lift my head. I had the physical strength, but I lacked the will. I just couldn't bring myself to look. My mother was wailing. Wow, dust on my head, my house be ruined. Where was I? What was I thinking? To let my darling daughter go out alone. Wah, wah, wah. How she blamed herself. And how her wails kept forcing upon me the fact that something truly dire had occurred. I began trying to force myself to sneak a glance down there, and I couldn't do it. And I kept trying. Finally, I caught one quick glimpse, just one glimpse, and oh my God, that wasn't my leg anymore. It was just meat. Oh, the redness of it, the utter redness. Ugh. And still I felt no pain. When they lifted me out of the taxi, I screamed, but not from pain. I screamed because I knew. It was knowing that forced such sounds out of my throat. The horror of what had happened. When we got to the hospital, they loaded me into a cart of some kind, rushed me indoors and put me on a table. There, such a stench of blood and rot assaulted my nose. I couldn't breathe. I was choking. I said to myself, this is it. I'm going to die. The end has come. The scene before me turned black. I slipped out of the world and for some time, blessedly, knew nothing about anything. Time passed. I suppose it did. It must have. While I lay there in shock, they brought my brothers to the hospital. My older brother, the boss of us. I had a lost a lot of blood. They gave me a transfusion of Muhammad's blood. And so my brothers became the second person that day to save my life. When I came to, I felt as if a mountain had been loaded onto one of my legs. The weight, that's what the pain felt like. Weight, pure weight. I said to my mother, what have you put on my legs? It's too heavy, get it off. My mother, poor thing, stripped an army blanket away that they had draped over my legs. But this, of course, didn't help. The weight I felt was not the blanket, and nothing could lighten that load. My legs were quite uncovered now, and still the weight pressed down, slowly revealing itself as pain that pulsed and pounded. Everyone was there around my bed, my whole family. I saw an aunt of mine who was feuding with our family. Even she had come. In Afghanistan, you know, when feuds spring up within a family, people might not speak to each other for months. They might refuse to visit each other's houses, but then at the holy festival of Eid, they meet at someone's house and make up. So I was thinking, is it Eid? It must be Eid. Otherwise, how had my aunt and my parents reconciled? If it wasn't Eid, something big must have happened. But only in a troubled and anxious way did I intuit that the big thing had some connection to the mountain resting atop my leg. The next day, finally, they lifted me into a cart to take me to the bandage changing room. At that point, I gathered my courage and took a long look at my legs. I saw that they were mangled. My family, running alongside my cart, now told me what had happened. You stepped on a landmine, they told me the whole story. The doctors filled in the clinical details. By the end of the day, I had it clear in my mind. I was in the Kabul Children's Hospital. I don't know which part of the city that is in. As I said, I don't know much about the layout of Kabul. It was quite a big building, that's all I know. And I was in an enormous room with rows of beds on this side and rows of beds on that side. 
and a long aisle running between them down the middle of the room and wounded children lay in every bed. There were no private rooms. On my floor, all the patients were children. I think the whole hospital was full of wounded children, but I don't know. That first day I just slept, if you can call it sleep. I don't know if they gave me some sort of medicine or if shock alone kept me oblivious. In any case, I have no memory of those hours. The second day I woke up, after that I was awake every day, and by then my legs were unmistakably hurting. Every morning the hospital orderlies carted me to the apocalypse. The apocalypse was the room where the bandages were changed. After that first time when they came to get me at that certain hour of the morning, I knew where they were taking me. I felt like an animal being hauled to slaughter. Changing the bandages was the most terrible ordeal. Oh, I could not have hurt more if they had thrust my legs directly into a fire. Every day the bandages had stuck to my wounds, to loosen them and to kill germs, I suppose. The nurses doused my bandaged legs with alcohol, which felt like liquid fire pouring through my skin. Then they would rip the bandages off. They weren't gentle. By no means were they gentle. I guess they felt it was better to get the thing over with quickly, but I always knew what was coming and the apprehension constituted a terrible ordeal in its own right. Then when the time came to rip, they had to hold me down. I was so small then and I couldn't stir below the waist, so I was easier to hold down than a wounded grown up. They only had to grip my arms and push down on my torso. Usually, two strong adults could do the job. My mother, my poor, terrified, distraught, exhausted, and guilt-tormented mother, would give me her arm or hand to bite when they were ripping the bandages off, and I would bite. Oh, I would bite hard. That's how I managed to stifle my shrieks, at least to some extent, by covering my mother's arm in bruises. She didn't have much fat on her, so biting her arm was like biting on bone. It hurt me now to think how I must have hurt my mother, but at the time I was lost in my own pain and nothing else existed for me. Now I have to say, oh darling mother, forgive me for what I put you through and thank you for what you did. She's a good mother, this mother of mine. I spent 40 days in an Afghan hospital the Afghan doctor was kind to me, but I don't know if he was a good doctor. There was no real way to tell. He had nothing to work with, no real medications, no tools, no medical equipment. That hospital did not even have bandages. Such was the story of Afghanistan at that time. The country had lost all its manufacturing. After all those years of war, it had used up all its medical supplies. It had run out of money to buy anything from abroad. Thus. The hospital had no way to restock the supplies it used or the equipment that broke. My family, like other families, had to scramble around the city every day, trying to buy bandages in the bazaar to supply what I would need the next day. When they couldn't come up with the proper bandages, the doctors and nurses had to wrap just ordinary cloth around my shredded legs. They didn't have antiseptic creams to put on the wounds before they wrapped them. They had only Vaseline, so that's what they smeared on the meat, just to keep the bandages from sticking. But it never worked. The bandages always stuck. It's scarcely any wonder that during my 40 days in that hospital, my right leg got infected. They changed all the bandages on the same table and didn't sterilize between patients. When they brought me in, they set me on other people's blood and other people's gore. As soon as I was carried away, other patients had their wounds dressed in my blood and gore. It wasn't the kind of scene you picture in America when you hear the word hospital. It wasn't that kind of hospital. As for repairing my legs, they could not even attempt it. They didn't have the medical pow prowess. They knew how to douse a wound in alcohol and how to change a bandage. That was all. In that hospital, they were just trying to keep me alive. They knew that every three months or so, a German organization came to Kabul and chose a limited number of wounded Afghan children for treatment in Germany. The Afghan doctors were just trying to keep me alive until the Germans came. 
They knew that the Germans were my one and only hope. If the Germans came and did not choose me, they would probably just have to let me go. But they were trying to keep me alive long enough to give me that one chance. They talked to my parents about the possibility of going to Germany. We can't treat Farah's wounds here, they confessed. We don't have the skills. Her case is too serious. Let the Germans take her. It's her only chance. When I heard about this conversation, I got scared. I was only seven at the time, remember? And I said, I can't go alone. I won't do it. My mother has to go with me. The doctor said, that's not how it works. They won't take your mother, only you. You have to go alone. Then the Afghan doctor spoke to me privately. He said, don't fret about this, my child. Go with the Germans, they're good people. You don't have to be afraid of them and they're wonderful doctors. Why, they'll fix your legs so well that when you come back, just wait and see. You'll be walking around in high-heeled shoes. We don't have the tools and skills to help you here, but in Germany, my child, they have experts, experts. Yes, when they get finished with you, your friends will envy you. You'll be the talk of the town strolling around in your high-heeled shoes. Go with the Germans, my child. And I believed him. In those last days at the hospital in Kabul, he managed to set my heart somewhat at ease. I still remember how he patted my head and stroked my hair and calmed me down. He had a kind heart. When the Germans finally arrived, the kindly doctors pointed at me at once. She's our most serious case, he said. You must definitely take that one. Well, the Germans took only those who were seriously wounded. If you had merely lost a hand or something and your wound was clean and looked to be healing, they wouldn't take you. In that sense, I was fortunate that my situation was so grave. I was awake when the German came. I was awake when they came to tell my doctors that I had been chosen. By then, I was so happy to hear the news. The Germans were going to fix me. I was going to wear high-heeled shoes.